There was a ruling today about Dentsu Incorporated's violation of labor laws. It proved that making employees work in an illegal manner is a crime and that corporations are the ones responsible. Takahashi Yukimi, the woman you just heard at this press conference, made public in the U.S. by NBC News, was denouncing how the advertising giant Dentsu Incorporated was found guilty of making its employees work more than the legal overtime limit. The press conference happened two years after Yukimi's daughter committed suicide from overworking at Dentsu Inc. You're listening to the podcast Seminar on Contemporary Global Issues. In this week's episode, Karoshi and Karo Jisets, Understanding How Tradition Shaped the Modern Work Culture of Japan, with your host, Esteban Reina. Takahashi Yukimi's daughter, Takahashi Matsuri, committed suicide by jumping off the Densu Tower on December 25, 2015 according to the newspaper Japan Today. Investigators found Matsuri killed herself because of quote-unquote stress from overwork. According to the New York Times article, Chief of Tensu to resign over employee suicide by Jonathan Sobel, these were some of the tweets Matsuri made in the moments leading to her suicide. They're making me work Saturdays and Sundays again! I'm gonna die. I'm so tired. I seriously want to end it all. Matsuri's name joins a long list of victims of death from overwork. According to a 2016 report titled Why Paper on Measures to Prevent Karoshi, etc. from the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, since 2002 an average of 133 Japanese have died each year from this phenomenon. Although we know Matsuri died from overwork, it is still unclear what causes this toxic culture of excessive unhealthy work in Japan. Her case begs the question, what killed Takahashi Matsuri? (laughs) To understand what led to Matsuri's death, we must take a look at the historical and cultural context under which Matsuri was working. We know Japan is a very old country with a long traditional history of samurai, Shinto, Buddhism and the like. Because of the influence that tradition has on modern Japanese society, it is important to understand Japanese traditions. Tradition, as defined by the online etymology dictionary, is quote-unquote the set of statements, beliefs or practices handed down from generation to generation. This also implies that traditions are maintained over generations if people continue believing they are the best practices to solve common issues. If we know that shaking hands is the best and most efficient way to greet people, then that tradition sticks around. Traditions may survive the test of time, but new developments influence contemporary societies around the world. One of those forces of change is modernization. Mark Elvin proposes a thorough definition of modernity in his article titled A Working Definition of Modernity, where he suggests that modernity is a social movement concerned with individual power over nature and other human beings. In other words, it is a social movement characterized by giving agency and individual power to members of that society. Even if the definitions are complex, we can tell when we look at a traditional or a modern society. For instance, we know how traditional medieval Europe looked like because we saw them live through generational customs and beliefs which they used to survive and settle communal norms. 
We also know how modern contemporary America looks like because there is widespread access to power for each person. The technological and societal advances of the last two centuries have allowed people in America to choose their own political destiny through voting, to move around their country through the mechanical power of cars, trains or airplanes, and to autonomously decide if they will live their lives following the old generational traditions their ancestors lived through. It is important to bring up the fact that modernity does not look the same in contemporary America as it does in modern Japan. While in America we can tell that tradition is less widespread and optional, things look different in Japan, where we can see tradition slipping through every context of life, from the widespread practice of ancient Shinto rituals throughout the year, to the use of formal language with elders as a sign of hierarchical respect. This coexistence of tradition and modernity is best explained by the concept of compressed modernity. According to Chang Kyung Sup's article, East Asia's Condensed Tran Transition to Second Modernity, compressed modernity describes the state of a civilization that experiences economic, political, and social changes in an extremely short amount of time. Under quick social changes, tradition is not completely eradicated and instead of being replaced, it remains and coexists with modernity. Knowing that modern Japan is still heavily influenced by tradition due to its state of compressed modernity, it is important to explore the traditions that gave way to Karoshi and Karo Jisatsu. According to Lauro Eriksen's article Karoshi's Phenomenon and its Collective Existential Damage, one of those traditions is the idea of the public gaze or Sekken. This idea had religious Buddhist meaning, which has reshaped after World War II to fit the new industrialized and capitalist Japanese context, pressuring Japanese workers to be careful of everyone's opinions about their behavior. The tradition of Sekken is related to other social ideas, such as tatemai or honne. Taka Iwao explains in his book chapter Business Ethics, a Japanese view, that in Japanese work environments, individuals are expected to follow certain social rules to maintain collective harmony. Those formal rules that dictate the expected ways of behaving in public are called tatemai while the real and honest motives from individuals, which many times are opposed to the tatemai, are called honne. Taka explains that the Japanese avoid severe criticism by fitting in through correct compliance with tatemai. But this also pressures employees to work long hours, in the worst cases leading to death from overwork or karoshi. Other academics have found other traditional social pressures that lead to excessive overtime work in Japan. According to Kang J. Hyung and his co-author's article Effective and Normative Motives to Work Overtime in Asian Organizations, many explanations for overtime work can be traced back to Confucian values and traditions. Kang and his colleagues explain that Japanese and other East Asian workers have normative and personal motivations to work overtime that are deeply rooted in Confucian ideas. The authors propose the four following Confucian ideas – seniority, relationships, righteousness, and benevolence. According to said article, Seniority refers to how Japanese are self-aware of their superior's authority and prefer to submit themselves to certain norms, such as not voicing dissenting opinions to senior members, disobeying orders, or leaving earlier than supervisors. This last norm has led to many Japanese to stay in their workstations after the workday is over, to wait until their superiors leave, to then go to their homes. The second Confucian idea is relationships, also known by the Chinese word wangxi, which according to Kang and co-authors is based on the desire to maintain good relationships between workers and supervisors. Many Japanese workers do this by turning a blind eye to contractual hour limitations and working overtime without documenting that time, showing the workers' intention to go above and beyond their contract's stipulations.
The third Confucian idea, righteousness, relates to the desire of Japanese workers to do the right thing for their companies and their benefit. In Japanese work environments, doing the right thing translates as pursuing perfection in their quality of work, even if that means working overtime to achieve perfection. The last Confucian idea is benevolence, which, according to the authors, it relates to the worker's desire to help the company and the collective, even if it means sacrificing their personal lives. This altruistic approach to work incentivizes Japanese workers to adopt a powerful work ethic to help the collective and their companies, all to comply with the Confucian tenet of enlarging others before enlarging oneself. We know tradition coexists with modernity in Japan. A fully industrialized society with a developed economy, Japan experiences both the expectations set in a capitalist work environment and the ritualistic traditions that survive to this day thanks to its state of compressed modernity. Having explained how traditions like Tatemai, Honne, Sekin, and Confucianism have set up the conditions to incentivize overwork and consequently Karoshi in Japan, it is now time to explore the effects of tradition in the Japanese work culture. Aline Masuda and co-authors made one of the most thorough studies about work cultures in individualistic and collectivistic cultures in their article titled Flexible Work Arrangements Availability and Their Relationship with Work to Family Conflict, Job Satisfaction and Turnover Intentions. The authors compared clusters of managers from individualistic cultures like the US and clusters of managers from collectivistic cultures from Latin America and Asian countries. In this study, the researchers found that while managers from individualistic countries like the US preferred working for companies that offered flexible work arrangements like part-time, work-from-home or flex-time, however, managers from collectivistic country clusters in Asia like Japan, China and Taiwan, they did not like flex-time and other flexible work arrangements. The authors explained that Asian managers did not find flex time any useful to improve their work-family conflicts, and quite interestingly, they found remote work to be disadvantageous to them, since they felt they could not create strong relationships with their subordinates. This study showed that managers from Asian cultures are not interested in making concessions for more flexible work times for themselves or for their subordinates. I propose this strictness from managers to invest time to their companies could be explained by traditional Confucian values that influence how modern work environments look like. The time inflexibility from Asian managers is not the only way in which Japanese work culture has been influenced by tradition. Another influence is corporate social responsibility in occupational health and safety. According to Richard Wokuch, author of the article Corporate Social Responsibility, Japanese Style Revisited, Japan has improved over the last 30 years in some aspects of corporate social responsibility. However, he emphasized that Japanese companies are still falling short of fixing issues leading to Karoshi and Karoji sets as he categorizes these issues as weaknesses of the Japanese system. He adds that a sense of loyalty to the company rooted in the traditional values of Bushido, or the way of the warrior, which samurai professed in feudal Japan, incentivizes Japanese workers to sacrifice personal time to save their honor and display their loyalty. Demonstrating how tradition still influences the Japanese work culture in this and all other aspects, including corporate social responsibility. As evidenced so far, traditional ideas like Confucian values, Sekin, Tatemai, Bushido, and Honne have influenced the modern Japanese work culture. The following are some of the opinions from Japanese workers interviewed by the YouTube channel Life Where I'm From about working in Japan. As you will hear, many of them feel pressured to conform to traditional social norms. 
Japan and Japanese culture, society expects like the perfect service. Um, the customer, like, yeah, expect that from the like the big company, even like you know. That's why like we work hard. I'm I'm super lucky still because my like the contract is like not overwork usually. When I gotta finish the work and then I can go home, but like the different like, contract like regular people are usually stay company for few hours every single day without thinking. Just like yeah, they they educate themselves. That's normal. <laughs> that's hard. Uh, so normal in a Japanese company is ten paid uh, vacation days. Um, and to be honest, I don't think many people actually take them. I think the, the, the traditional Japanese company wasn't for me. I mean, I didn't have enough freedom and I felt like uh, there's a lot of, there's the hierarchy. The anecdotal evidence you just heard represents just a fraction of how the Japanese work culture looks like. Kenneth Adams explores the more extreme cases of loyalty to modern Japanese companies in his article Japan, the, the Sacrificial Society. In his work, he describes the lives of the so-called salarymen, men who devote their lives and loyalty to the company. Adams uses the metaphor of the quote-unquote corporate warrior, who sacrifices their all for the business and does not pass judgment on their supervisors even going as far as being absent from home for most of, a, of the week and spending only an average of 33 minutes on child rearing a day. According to Yu Wei Xin and her co-author's article Another Work Family Interface, Work Characteristics and Family Intentions in Japan, the sacrificial nature from the salarymen and other Japanese workers forces them to postpone marriage and childbearing at a societal level since they know that long work hours increase family tension and worsens the workers' and their families' well-being. Not only salarymen are forced to push their marriage and childbearing plans later in life and be put in dangerous work conditions, some scholars have argued their sexuality has been crafted and regulated through economic and political constraints. According to Ramit Dasgupta's book, Rereading the Salaryman in Japan, Crafting Masculinities, the Japanese salaryman's sexuality has been negotiated and crafted after decades of postmodern socialization, where the identity of salaryman has declared to be typically urban, middle class, white collar, and heterosexual. Dasgupta explains that the Japanese work culture after World War II, in connection to traditional values, influenced the creation of this stereotypical and hegemonic identity. Quite counterproductively, this identity forces Japanese men to work long hours and postpone childbearing later in life, while at the same time it poses the expectations for salarymen to be heterosexual men that raise children under extremely unhealthy work conditions. <laughs> From Confucius to feudal samurai, the history of Japan and its traditions have shaped how modern Japanese work culture looks like, and that includes the social issues of karoshi and karojisats. It is important to note how widespread these social issues are and what their implications represent for Japan. According to Scott North and his co-author's article, Hope Found in Lives Lost, Karoshi and the Pursuit of Workers' Rights in Japan, during the post-war period, Japan experienced quick economic growth. But after the appreciation of the Japanese yen and the 1973 oil crisis, growth and productivity stymied. The decrease in productivity and rising production costs forced managers to make up for the deficit by increasing labor intensity and work hours. Although many men protested, although many men protested in 1974 and 75, quote unquote, hegemonic masculine expectations of self-sacrifice led to a majoritarian male force to acquiesce and adopt a culture of overwork. We know that Karoshi and Karojisets have ancient roots from traditional Confucian and social expectations as discussed before. Even though they only became a widespread and visible social issue, 
until the 20th century. According to Jeremy Tsuchitani Watson's article, Karoshi Karojisats and Gender Discrimination, Japan's Human Rights Violations, Kawahito Hiroshi, who is the head of the National Defense Council for Victims of Karoshi, has worked since the 1980s representing the relatives of those victims to Karoshi. According to Kawahito, since the 80s, 95% of his cases were middle-aged men, but now he estimates that 20% of cases involve women, showing a trend of more women entering the Japanese workforce since the 80s, but also an increase in female victims to Karoshi and Karojisats. Kawanishi Yuko explains in her article on Karojisats, why do Japanese workers work themselves to death? that although Karoshi is not limited to only one demographic, it is reasonable to see a larger proportion of men suffering from this problem, partly because of a lesser ratio of women in the workforce. She adds that suicides from overwork can be attributed in most of the cases to depression, caused by excessive expectations, long work hours without holidays or rest, and extraordinary mental and physical pressures. According to Kawanishi, most of the people who commit karoji sets blame themselves because they do not meet work expectations. While this explains the cases from suicide from overwork, it is also important to clarify the science that leads to deaths from overwork. Katarina Jude and her co-authors study titled The Psychosocial Work Environment is Associated with Risk of Stroke at Working Age shows that people were more likely to experience strokes if they had adverse work conditions, which include job strains like excessive overtime work, low rewards for their effort, and conflicts at work. Another study titled Globalization, Work and Cardiovascular Disease by Peter Schnall and co-authors showed that people who work for long hours present an elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. Not only that, but they also can accelerate their disease if they experience other stressors like job strains and shift work in addition to long work hours. Another article titled Recognition, Compensation and Prevention of Kuroshi and Death Due to Overwork by Eguchi, Hisashi and co-authors shows that while long hours of work contribute to Kuroshi and Karoji sets, recent studies show that working patterns can also lead to death from overwork, including frequent business trips, extreme work environments and psychological distress, among others. Yamaushi Takashi and co-authors propose in their article Overwork-Related Disorders in Japan, Recent Trends and Developments of a National Policy to Promote Preventive Measures, that in 2015, the fiscal year after the Japanese government enacted an act to combat karoshi and karoji sets, the number of claims of occupational compensation for work-related mental disorders and brain and heart diseases increased. Following widespread media coverage of these issues and increased concern over death from overwork. It is also important to discuss how traditional ideas about gender influence Kuroshi and Karoji sets. While it was mentioned earlier that women compose a smaller proportion of cases of Karoshi, this can be attributed to the gender divisions of labor and gender roles in Japan. According to Ono Hiroshi's article, why do the Japanese work long hours? Sociological perspectives on long working hours in Japan. The salaryman is not a model of femininity, but a model of masculinity. Traditional gender roles stipulated that women would work only if the husband's income wasn't enough to sustain the family, and only in a way that would not interfere with her home responsibilities. These traditional gender roles also influence the tax code, which makes women forfeit their spousal deductions if their income exceeds a certain amount, which, open quote, reflects the social concept of the wife working as long as there is no interference, end quote. Nemoto Kumiko adds in her article, Long Working Hours and the Corporate Gender Divide in Japan, that educated women workers in Japan are divided into career-oriented and family-oriented routes, but this happens because of their limited options and opportunities, such as the already mentioned long working hours or tax code limitations. 
As we explore through this podcast, Karoshi and Karoji sets are large social issues that affect the lives of millions of Japanese men and women. Extenuating work hours and additional work stressors lead to high rates of suicide and work related heart and brain diseases that take away hundreds of lives a year. As we remember the lives of the victims to Karoshi and Karoji sets, like Takahashi Matsuri, we understand now that Japan is a unique place where quick and compressed modernization gave way to the coexistence of tradition and modernity in the same time and space. This unique phenomenon meant that the Japanese people had to experience industrialization and capitalism in the context of surviving ancient traditions like tatemai, honne, seken, bushido, gender roles and the Confucian values of seniority, relationships, righteousness and benevolence. All of these surviving traditions that carried over to a highly industrialized and developed economy incentivized managers to expect from their subordinates loyalty and long work hours. These factors combined with low productivity and high production costs since the mid-70s gave way to the widespread social issues of Karoshi and Karoji sets. Coming back to the first question I posed, what killed Takahashi Matsuri? We can say with some certainty that the combination of tradition and modernity in a capitalist economic model was responsible for Takahashi's death. May she and all the victims of this social problem rest in peace. You heard the podcast Seminar on Contemporary Global Issues. This week's episode was Karoshi and Karo Jisats, Understanding How Tradition Shaped the Modern Work Culture of Japan. I was your host, Esteban Reina. Thank you.